Hey guys, criminal defense attorney Ryan Pasiga, and today I'm going to tell you about a case study on a third degree criminal sexual conduct case I had that went to trial. And uh, I got the case about two years ago. It was backed up for a couple of reasons. Uh, but at any rate, the point is this. The allegations were that a man that was 46 years old at the time and a woman that was 22 years old at the time were next door neighbors. She was actually living in the basement of her aunt and uncle's house here in Minnesota. Um, and she was working for an airline. And they knew each other a little bit, but they had never really hung out, at least alone in the neighborhood. Sometimes groups of people would get together. But at any rate, um, one night she goes out to a bar and has a couple of drinks with a friend of hers. And they decide that they're going to go get a bottle of vodka um, before the liquor store closes and go back uh, to her place. And they start having, uh, they're going to play this TikTok challenge where they're doing a shot every 10 minutes. And when the two women uh, get back, they see the next door neighbor there and uh, the accuser ends up inviting him over to come join them to drink. He says no a couple times and finally he comes over, brings a drink over of his own. And uh, the women start doing this TikTok challenge where they're supposed to do a shot every 10 minutes. There's a dispute about whether they did the full six in an hour or not, or whether they were doing full shots or not. But nonetheless, they certainly did get intoxicated, whether they had four or five or six. And, and he had joined for three of those as well uh, and had a couple white claws. So uh, by that time, by about 10 o'clock, uh, the three of them are intoxicated. And uh, later on, they end up doing a selfie, a few selfies together. Her friend takes a selfie with all three of them, and uh, my client and the accuser ended up cheek to cheek in it. Uh, and then there's a dispute about kind of what happens after that. There is some dancing on this deck, uh, all three of them together. Um, but the women, uh, well, next thing you know, sex happens um, between the accuser and my client. And uh, she wakes up in the middle of the night and freaks out and starts wondering if she cheated on her boyfriend, has a little bit of a blackout from how much she had to drink, and she's remembering parts and not others. And uh, her friend's mom uh, comes over because her friend's wasted and then sees the woman kind of crying that way and tells her you've been raped and calls the police. The police interview her uh, in the bed. She's telling the police while the police are interviewing her, I think this is my fault, not his. Um, I kept telling him it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But she's also confused and thought she was laying in some vomit and, and while the sex was happening. Uh, and she was wrong about that. There wasn't any vomit there. But nonetheless, um, there was. Uh, so they encourage her to go get uh, a sex assault exam at the hospital. Uh, and in the meantime, her friends start saying, well, I've been touched too and everything like that. So they send her for one. No DNA comes back on the friend whatsoever. Um, but um, there is some DNA on, on the woman who was saying that uh, now that she's potentially been sex assaulted or at least had really drunk sex. So police go interview the same day, my client, and he tells the police right away, he's like, well, we got really handsy with each other. And then they're like, did anything more happen? And he says, yeah, his you know, hand was, there was sexual penetration. Um, but then he said her condition in the middle of the sex just completely changed. She went from, you know, we were both intoxicated to all of a sudden she wasn't okay. Like she was way too intoxicated. He immediately stopped and he helped her uh, into a room and go into bed and he left. And so, um, the detective in the case, um, kind of becomes buddy, buddy with the accuser in a way and starts asking you know, kind of picking a team rather than conducting a fair investigation in this thing and urging her to charge it out. And more and more people are pressuring her to charge it, and, and eventually it gets charged. And uh, despite him agreeing to go to DNA and everything like that, they put an arrest warrant out for him rather than just saying, you know, here's a, here's a mailed court date, which put him through the bail process and everything like that. Uh, aunt and uncle whose house this lady lived at, they whipped up the whole neighborhood about it. And the whole neighborhood just turned on the guy without ever hearing his side of the story, as can happen in these kinds of allegations. He ended up selling his house and moving because it got so bad. Um, 
But as the case went on, there was this big dispute. Now, the women who had invited him over to drink with them and do, or they're doing selfies after an hour with him and dancing with him, all of a sudden started to make him out to be like this dad-like creep. Like, we would never hang out with a guy that old, and he was like dad-like, and he was trying to grab us both all night and everything like that, which was just contrary to the evidence that we had. Um, and so as the case is going on, now he understands he's got some risk. I mean, any two time, you know, people are getting intoxicated like that and there's that going on. He didn't, you know, know how this was going to go. Um, so he decided, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to work on himself as well. And he went and, and got some help. He got a psychosex exam done and followed the recommendations of that. He became suicidal because these allegations can do that to someone. There's a lot of men who become suicidal if they're accused of this sort of thing. Um, and we had to really work through that. And and there were times that, that I felt a little bit more like a therapist to him than his lawyer, which in criminal defense, that is that often can happen. People are going through the hardest times of their lives, and they're they're leaning on anybody that's there for them, their family, friends, and, and their lawyer. But to see him through those hard times... Um, that's, that's tough to see. Um, but at any rate, he made it through that. And, um, the prosecutors refused to offer a, a dispositional departure dis despite the therapy had done and everything he had done. They were absolutely not going to offer anything short of prison. And in fact, they filed motions for Blakely, which means aggravating factors. And, uh, they wanted to get his sentence doubled up to 96 months or, or about, uh, Eight, eight years in prison. Um, so uh, given that, the case went to trial, okay? And, and uh, at the trial, the accuser testified first. Um, and her, her theme was that basically her brother had been accused of a sex assault long ago, and so she would never put someone else through that because it was hell on her family when her brother was accused of that. But she also said that she stalked her brother's accuser, got all over uh, her whole background and everything like that, and basically proved that the gal was a liar in life and in general. And so she had a FAA a license and a class one medical. She's actually got a commercial pilot's license, and now she's working uh, for an airline, uh, which is flying up to people, up to 70 people on regional jets, okay? And the FAA medical form, uh, is there's two four parts of it. There's the applicant part of it and the medical part of it to get your medical clearance for this stuff. And on that form, she had told the detective, sorry, I got to back up, that she had had two blackout drinking episodes, once from this night and then once one time before. And a blackout is different than passing out. A blackout is where someone consumes alcohol and they don't remember parts of it the next day because of the way the memory encodes from drinking uh, it doesn't mean that they don't know what they're doing in the time necessarily, but when they wake up later, the memory doesn't save the right way. That's what a blackout is, as opposed to pass out, which you know means you're you're kind of not conscious or you're asleep. Um, so at any rate, um, she had told the detective she had you know two drinking blackout episodes before, and on many other occasions she drinks, she'll lose control, she doesn't forget things, but she'll lose control. Well. The FAA application asks about those things, um, and she had said no on it multiple times. And uh, I had found out that she had that license, and we, we asked her about that. And she fought it and initially blamed it on her doctor, saying, well, I told the doctor, and he told me it was discretionary, which is just a bunch of baloney. There's no way the FAA would let that be discretionary and let people fly up to even 747s and then just decide to hide any alcohol issues from the FAA. That's, I, I knew that wasn't to be true. Um, and the jury, that was really important to them. Um, but in addition to that, her testimony had changed over time uh, quite a bit. And, and the detective was actually, we caught the detective even coaching her through one of the changes on that, which we brought up to the jury as well. And uh, the friend had testified and there were major inconsistencies in, in her testimony. Um, and the jury, obviously, this, the, this evidence was powerful to show that she wasn't being truthful as well for parts of it. But still, there was that concern. Would the jury think, these were two intoxicated people, and she regretted her decision the next day? Uh, or was this a situation where um, she really wasn't okay? And so um, eventually, after all of the cross-examination of the state's witnesses, which was very thorough, um, then we had our own expert testify on what blackouts are versus passouts, and then my client testified. 
And, and there we had to trust the jury. Um, there were parts that hadn't even come into his police statement that um, if he wanted to be honest with the jury, we wanted to give them everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly in the case, and not just um, the parts that were already uh, discussed. We had to trust the jury that if we were going to um, ask them to trust us, we had to trust them. And so he was he let it all out there for them, and that was a really scary thing to do because if they don't believe him, there's even more ways to try to find him guilty. But he had to be honest about all of that. Um, and so after that, closing arguments. Now, I got to hand it to the prosecutor. She gave the best closing argument I think I've ever seen a prosecutor give in any of the trials I've ever had in my over 22-year career now, okay? Um, and then it was my time, and uh, we brought it home for him. We brought it home for him. So after a trial that was about a week and a half long, the jury was about two and a half hours into deliberation, and they had a question. And they wanted to see one of the videos again, uh, which was a call between the detective and the accuser weeks later where the, the, the detective tells her, hey, the defendant corroborated some of what you were saying. And she was crying in the call and these sorts of things. And, uh, but this was also the same call where the detective had suggested to her um, a different answer than she had given to police before. And the detective knew this, and I had pointed that out to the jury. So when they're listening to this emotional call, I'm wondering, oh, man, are they going to get caught up in the emotion of this call and find them guilty based on the emotion of that or not? I hope not, because there's also this thing I pointed out in that call. Four minutes after I listened to that recording again, and less than three hours uh, into their deliberations, they found him not guilty. And when that happened, he immediately broke into tears, bawling, bawling in my arms, um, his whole family behind me in the courtroom, his elderly parents, his brother, his ex-wife, who he was divorced by the time of this, his current girlfriend, um, and his other supporters all bawling. And the issue in the case was that it became a real double standard, um, Anything that was inconsistent or a lie that the, that the accuser was saying, the prosecutor chalked up to trauma, processing, all of these sorts of things. There was an excuse for everything she was, she was saying differently. But anything he were to say differently, of course, was just a right away in her mind a lie, right? So if she's different, she, there's an excuse for it. If he's saying it, it's a lie, right? Um, she was suggesting that he should have taken better care of them when they were drunk and should have called the neighbors for them or should have called the police for them or all of these sorts of things. Of course, when I asked them if they should have done that for one another that night, um, then it was preposterous that they should have to do that. So these were some of the double standards that the prosecutor was trying to impose uh, and not being fair to him, but of course expecting everything of him and uh, letting them off the hook with all of their behavior. And that just wasn't fair here. Um, and of course she had talked about her guilt that she had cheated that, you know, maybe this was all a joke because she cheated on, uh, her boyfriend that she was dating. The inhibitions were lowered and unfortunately she, she made a decision with that alcohol that she didn't want to live with the next day. Now that's not to say that of course sex assaults happen and when they do they're, they're criminal, but there are unfortunately reasons for false allegations as well. And there is a tendency in our society to just believe these allegations the minute they're made and how dare you question them and how dare you, you, you're, you if you're questioning anything, then you're blaming the victim and all these things. And that's not fair um, because there are people, usually men, who are uh, falsely accused of sex assault for a variety of reasons. A woman's boyfriend uh, finding out, boyfriend or husband finding out the, um, the regret of the decision that was made the night before to end up having a sexual encounter with someone they didn't maybe think that they were going to earlier in the night. Uh, maybe the guy uh, blows them off the next day or leaves, um, or a host of other reasons, right? The, so there are reasons that these false allegations are made, and, uh, and when that happens, that can be devastating to somebody. So I was grateful that we were able to have a jury that could see through that, that could search the, for the truth with us, um, it was astonishing to me that despite lying to the FAA on about four or five separate applications every six months to keep this class one medical, that the prosecutor would just 
excuse all of that and not be, it wasn't a big deal to her at all that that person had lied under oath that many times. And, um, it mattered to the jury and, uh, and that's what mattered. You know, this guy was a uh, father. They made a lot of the, the age differences between the two, but the jury and selection had told me they didn't have a problem with the age difference. They're, they're adults. During the trial, the, the prosecutor was trying to call the two girls rather than women to try to inflame the prejudices or passions of the jury, of course, and suggested that he had cheated on his girlfriend and, you know, and all those things. But she had a boyfriend and, you know, they weren't going after her for that. So these, this was just the unfair double standard. At any rate, he was found not guilty. A week before the trial, he had dropped his college uh, freshman off for his first year of college halfway across the country and not knowing if he was going to see his son again at Christmas um, or Thanksgiving or any of the other, his birthday or any of those holidays. And he had a sophomore in high school and not knowing if he'd be going home that night because if he was found guilty at that trial, he would have been taken into custody and he would have woken up the next morning in a cold jail cell with an orange outfit on and a terrible breakfast and a new roommate that he had never met and wouldn't like. Um, and I thought about that the next morning when I woke up in my bed. The first thing I thought about was my client and that he was waking up in his bed that next morning. And I was able to talk to his college son after the verdict who was so grateful that his dad wasn't going to be going to prison um, because that would have changed not only my client's life, but the life of his two children um, and several other people. So these cases are uh, exhausting. They're a battle we spent. I was pulling 12 to 16 hour days every day of the trial uh, for a week and a half there, weekend, Labor Day, you name it. And you just got to do what you got to do to bring it home for someone because these are serious allegations. Um, so that's the case study. I'm grateful for that. Um, and that's what we bring for clients on every case. Um, if we're preparing for a trial, it's a team effort. My, my assistant Pam was with me through the whole trial, helping me stay organized in it, taking great notes. And the rest of our staff was great in the preparation as I'm bouncing ideas off for cross-examination and exhibit preparation and the like. It was a true team effort and I'm grateful for that. Um, if you or a loved one are accused of a serious crime and you want a lawyer who will really go to trial for you and not just say they go to trial but mean it, do it and mean it and get good results, you can give me a call and see if we're a good fit for one another. I'm criminal defense attorney Ryan Pasiga. You can find me at arrestedmn.com or call me at 612-339-5844. I almost forgot story of the bison I, I you heard other videos of mine about this but um, when there's a storm that comes uh, cows will run the other direction from it bison turn right into the storm and they go through it and that has become <clears throat> the logo for my law firm it's a mantra that I share with clients that I'll guide them through the storm that we're not going to run from it we have to turn into it and I'll lead you through it, and we'll go through that step by step by step. But we're going to get through the storm that way rather than run through it. And we'll get to those sunny, beautiful pastures on the other side if we just are willing to go through it together. God bless.